there's fresh water here. There's alligators. <laughs> wow. That's scary. Nah, you oh. learn to live with them, but I don't want to swim with them. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't want to either. Okay. It looks like we are live. Uh, this is Author Life. I'm Luke T. Barnett, uh, where we get to know the authors and so that you guys can get to know them. I'm here with Rick. I never asked you how to pronounce your name right. Is it Partlow? Partlow, just like it's spelled, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, Rick Partlow, author of Glory Bo Boy. I can't even talk today. Author of Glory Boy uh, and numerous, numerous uh, books. Uh, Rick Partlow is the rarest of species, a native Floridian. Born in Tampa, he attended Florida Southern College and graduated with a degree in history and, and a commission in the U.S. Army as an infantry officer. His lifelong love of science fiction began with Have Space Suit Will Travel, which is an awesome title, by the way, uh, and other Heinlein juveniles and traveled through Clifford's, Clifford Simak, Asimov, Clark, and on to William Gibson, Walter... John Williams, and Peter F. Hamilton. And somewhere submerged in the world worlds of others, Rick began to create his own worlds. He, be, he has written 19 books in five different series, and his short stories have been included in nine different anthologies. He's working on a six new series for Atheon Books, a six-volume military sci-fi saga about a mercenary unit called Wholesale Slaughter. The first three books should be out this summer. He is currently lives in central Florida with his wife, two children, and willful mutt of a dog. Besides writing and reading science fiction and fantasy, he enjoys outdoor photography, hiking, and camping. Uh, you want to add anything to that? I'm also working on another series with uh, co-writing it with Drew Avery. Called, uh, the, it's called Broken Arrow Mercenary Force, or BAMF nice. for short. And uh, the first book in that should be out in April. And I've been invited to write a novel in the new Nova Blue series for Keystroke Medium, their their Space Cop series. Their Space oh, Cop sweet. That's awesome. I didn't know they were recruiting already. That's awesome. So I'm going to write a Bounty Hunter book in there. Oh, that's cool. I love Bounty Hunters. So is it like a legal type of Bounty Hunter, or is it like a, one of those like outlaw type Bounty Hunters? Uh, it's It's legal. It's within the law. Oh, okay. That's they have bounty hunters in the, like the frontier areas where it's too hard to get cops in there. <laughs> That's pretty sweet. So, um, what was uh, so? Tell us about Glory Boy. Actually, first tell us uh, how you got into writing. As far as uh, I guess that's covered in the, your bio there. So you're just inspired by all that and you started writing. Well, I actually started writing from the time I was really, really small. My, my dad taught me how to read. Well, between him and comic books, basically. I learned to read when I was about three years old. Nice. And um, I started drawing my own comic books. And uh, at the time, I was reading Richie Rich and, you know. Yeah. And uh, Disney cartoons, you know, things like that. But so I started doing that first. And as I started to read science fiction, I, I tried to write science fiction. And it actually took me quite a while to get to the point where I could write science fiction stories because I, I loved reading them, but I didn't quite have the knowledge base to write them. Oh, okay. Yeah. So first off to make sense as I got, as I got older, like in the, into my tweens, I started writing more science fiction and um, I think I've, I think I started writing my first science fiction novel when I was 18. I didn't finish it for a long, long time, but I, I started then. Sounds familiar. So, uh, actually, so what, Glory Boy was the first science fiction novel I started to write. Oh, really? So it's like your uh, that was like your first love or something. <laughs> well, I was sitting in church uh, and I was doodling on a sheet of paper because that's what I did in church. I would, I, I was, I'm one of those people that when I'm like listening to lectures or taking notes or something, I I draw a lot. Mm -hmm. It helps me to stay focused. Focus. Yeah. And I was drawing a futuristic looking commando all in black with a big laser type gun, you know? So I started thinking if this guy were real, what, what would the situation be? What kind of uh, technology would he have? What, what kind of situation would you use a commando in science fiction? So I started reading up on, um, there's a lot of speculative uh, nonfiction that 
was in books like uh, There Will Be War by Jerry Pornell or in Analog Magazine, uh, different places, but this pre-internet days. Mm-hmm. So I um, looked up all this stuff and I started making a, a world around this one drawing. And I came up with the first few chapters of Glory Boy and the basic plot for it. And then um, when I got serious about writing in the um, mid 90s, I decided to, instead of writing the story of Glory Boy, which is a war story, I went with a post war type of story with the main character from that book, where he's kind of an embittered vet who has gone into law enforcement and he he's seen like he's embittered because the war that he fought to save his planet from the aliens has led to his planet being kind of ruined by these big monopolies that uh, have taken it over for mining it wow so he gets to fight them and the, and that's the birthright series the birthright trilogy and i finished it and i was trying to decide what to do next I was, should i just invent a whole new other world to you know, in another universe to start write, writing in a future history. And I'm like, well, I still have Glory Boy sitting around. Let me do that first and put off writing anything new. Mm-hmm. And it was the best-selling book I've had. That's sort of a throwaway that I wanted to get out <laughs> there to keep you know, to write anything new. It's surprising how sometimes uh, stuff we think is no good is just going to like explode uh, on on the readers. Uh, because that was what that was what Stephen King did. Like he was he I was reading his book on writing. I didn't get all the way through it, uh, but he said that he started writing Carrie, and he thought it was just like lousy. He the character was uninteresting. And it was just garbage. So he just threw it in the garbage, and his wife found it, and he like he came home from from his job at the time, and he, she was like sitting at the desk reading, and she's like, I think you should, should write this, and he's like, No, it's garbage. She's like, No, no, I think you should really write this, and that wound up being the one his big break that got him started in his career. I mean, he was still writing other things, but you know, that was like this big, big, big blow up novel. <laughs> sort of the opposite of, uh, was it wrote Dr. Jekyll, and Mr. Hyde, Robert Louis Stevenson, I think. I can't remember. Uh, but his wife found the manuscript and threw it in the garbage. <laughs> oh, I did not know that. <laughs> yeah. Wow. She thought it was like demonic or something. Well, I haven't read it. I should it probably, probably was, especially for the time. Um, so why, why, what was the decision for the word for the name glory boy? What was the decision for that? Uh, well, I came up with that name a long time ago when I was in my late teens, I guess I was, uh, <clears throat> I was making the backstory for the book and I wanted to give a name to the Mer- to the commando unit that he belonged to. And the idea was it was so top secret, nobody would ever hear of it. So hmm. Glory Boys was like a sarcastic nickname they had for each other. Oh, because okay. Nobody, nobody knew who they were. That's cool. So, um, so you have a, uh, so you have the the Birthright series, which is the basically the sequel series to Glory Boy, right? Right. Yeah, it's the or, same universe. Right. Um, and I see you've written in a number of. Uh, anthologies, including um, uh, Kingdoms of Iron and Stone. Uh, I've written uh, in step seven and all. Uh, I've wow. written three, three different anthologies for seven that have been published already, I should say. Three different anthologies for um, Alistair Shaw. Uh, he, he has, he, he's a puts out anthologies like for different themes, like Renegade, uh, Outlaw, uh, Officer. You know, you, you'll put different, differently themed military science fiction or space opera anthologies, and he asked for people to contribute. Okay. So I, I've put some in there. I had one in uh, Into the Black, which was an anthology by... Oh. Paul Corcoran, I want to say. Um, And then another one called uh, Oh, Backblast Area Clear with uh, J.R. Hanley. I had a a short story in that one. And there's been several others. The latest one is uh, Kingdoms of Iron and Stone. And also I'm going to have one in the new 
KSM Near Future Anthology, which I guess has not been t titled yet. So whenever that comes out. And I'm going to have one in a Mecca anthology by J.F. Holmes. It'll be coming out in the spring. That's awesome. So have you done, have you done any uh, co-writing or has it just been anthologies you've been contributing to? I am doing my first collaboration with Drew Avery right now. Oh. At, uh, Broken Arrow Mercenary Force. The first book is called Merchants of War. It should come out next month. That's cool. And so you're not full-time writing, are you, yet? I kind of am. I I have a day job, but it's it's not like a career type job. It's just some mm -hmm. direction money. So writing, you know, boomer bust is my career. That's cool. Yeah. yeah I'm hoping to uh reach that point sooner than later. <laughs> I'm a kind of a weird I'm a kind of a weird position right now because I am writing more words and more stuff than I have ever written before at one time. And yet I am not publishing anything because it's all banked up for different. Oh yeah. I've so got eight, all. Eight on books, you know, I'm writing a six book series for them. I'm on book four, but they're waiting to publish the first three books until the summer. So I have, you know, hundreds of thousands of words saved up with them. This thing I'm writing with Drew, I'm writing on that. I haven't, that's not going to be out until April and I'm going to start writing the bounty hunter book. That's going to be out whenever KSM wants to release it. And I've never before wait, taken this long, not never before when I first started out, I took this long, but since 2016, I have not taken this long between releases. I've been releasing a book every two to three months consistently. Oh, and, wow. now, and now it's been a good three and a half months since I released one and it'll be, another month until I do. Wow. So it'll be like a big avalanche in the summer of all yeah. this. Wow. <laughs> that should give you a good boost. Hopefully. Yeah. Lips to God's ears. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, yeah. I, I, I was going, I thought about, I tried to think of a story to put in the near anthro, uh, near future anthology. I couldn't think of one. And actually just recently I thought of one because I have this fan fiction I wrote as a crossover between perfect dark Tomb Raider and Metroid. Um, hmm. I don't know if you've played any of those games, but um, my son has. Uh, Perfect Dark is um, is a near future storyline, and I wanted to take the fan fiction and make it into a actual sellable book. You know, and obviously not plagiarizing anything, but making my own characters, whatever. Um, but um, I I didn't even think about the fact that Perfect Dark was a near future type of story. And I could have used that for the near future anthology. <laughs> so I just kind of missed the boat on that one. Well, I had a, I had an idea for a whole universe of uh, novels, you know, multiple novels set in a future where humans are contacted by aliens that are on the run from a war. And when the time came from the near future anthology, that was basically the only setup that I had that was set in the near future. Most of my books are at least a couple of hundred years in the future. Oh, okay. So that one was that one was within the next fifty years. So I decided to riff off of that one for the short story. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, I think they're doing the space opera anthology next and I'm trying to work on something for that. Uh, hopefully I that'll... need to come up with a plot. <laughs> <laughs> I just pants it, so I make up the plot as I go. Oh, I I, get... I, used, I used to pants all my stories, but can't do it anymore. It takes too long. Oh, it takes too long. Yeah. When I first started uh, publishing, I was I I was I self-published the first two books that I'd written, which were Birthright and Duty on Our Planet, which I had written to try to get published. And I had an agent. Take it with a trad club. Yeah, I, I had an agent, and uh, they she tried to market those things for a couple years until our contract ran out and I kind of gave up on it for several years and then around 20 late 2010 a friend of mine started saying people are self-publishing books on Amazon you know as ebooks you should look into that and I was like no that's like vanity publishing you know <laughs> people do that are losers but finally he told me I've read articles people are making a lot of money you know and I, I thought well at least somebody besides my immediate family will read it so yeah. I put both of them on there, and I was surprised when they sold pretty well. 
And the problem was I didn't have any sequels written. So it took me 14 months to write the first sequel to Duty on Our Planet. And then another, I think, 16 months to write the second sequel. These are big books, like 180, 190,000 words. Oh, nice. Yeah. And then I started writing sequels to Birthright, and that took like 12 months and then 11 months. So it took me a long time to write. I was pantsing them pretty much all the way through the first six books. And Glory Boy was the first book that I that I actually sat down and wrote a chapter-by-chapter chapter outline for. Mm. And the only reason I did it was because I had mentioned – things that had happened in glory boy in the, in the, in the birthright trilogy, because it's the but, same character and he's hanging out with a bunch of the people he knew during the war. So they tell war stories and they mention things that had happened. And I'm like, I can't contradict that. So I've got to write down exactly what happens in every chapter. And it only took me three months to write the book. So I'm like, wow. maybe I should start plotting novels. <laughs> and yeah. I, I, I've gotten to the point now where I'm, I know I run into a lot of people that get writer's block. I never get writer's block because all that's taken care of ahead of time. I don't mm -hmm. have to sit down and think, what am I going to have the characters do now? I just look at the outline I wrote. Now, I, sometimes it takes a while for me to get through the outline. I guess that's kind of writer's block in a way, but I get that done in, ahead of time. And that's all in the beginning, the lead up. And I can do that while I'm writing something else. And then when the time comes, I, I just have to, describe the things that I know are going to happen. That's pretty awesome. You see, I, I, that's exactly what happens to me when I try to, to plot. I was like, I just get stuck and I can't think of what I want the story to go to because it's like logical step-by-step -step thinking is a problem for me sometimes in certain applications. So like making an outline and making a, like a, a, a directed plan step-by-step. -step. I, I, I don't know how you do it, but I know a lot of people have trouble with it, like in an outline, like bullet point form or, you know, 1A, 2A. What I do, I write a general synopsis of what I want the story to be. Just just like a two or three paragraphs. I want this to happen, this to happen, this to happen in the story. I want this is where I want to start. This is where I want it to end. If there's any things I can think of ahead of time that I know I want to happen, I write those down. And then... I fill that in a little bit of the background. I'll make character sketches. And then finally, once I got all the background information, the character information, what I know I really want to basically happen in the story, and I'll go, I'll keep filling that in in more detail until I have probably about a couple of thousand words worth of, at least, worth of detail there. And then I'll start a chapter by chapter outline. And at first, It'll be like one sentence, maybe two. Uh, the chapter one, introduce the hero in this situation. Chapter, in chapter two, he meets this person. But then I'll go back after I finish it, you know, from beginning to end, I'll go back and I'll add more lines as they come to me. And then I'll go back again. And if I think of a phrase of, dial of dialogue that, sound that sounds good in my head, I'll add that underneath that chapter. Or if there's a note that I come up with, like, uh, note, this character should have a fear of cats. <laughs> I'll, I'll put that in the chapter. You know, I'll, yeah. I'll just keep adding and adding until I've got about ten to 12,000 words worth of outline. And at that point, it's it's written. The, the, the plot is written. You know, it, it may take a while to get to that point, but you don't have to sit down for hours and do that. Just do the bare minimum first, just an idea. And then go back to it for a little bit every day and fill in little bits. Some people call that fat outlining, but I just came up, I came to that conclusion by my on my own without before I heard the name. Yeah, no, no, I think that's great. I mean, if you can find a method that works for you, that's fantastic. That's kind of similar to what Chris Fox does. I don't know if you watch any of his videos, um, but he uh, uh, he does something similar. Like he'll just have a premise, and then he'll have he'll kind of fill it out, and then he'll fill out more, and then he'll make. I don't know if he's sure if he makes an actual chapter by chapter outline, um, but he has a questions file. And so I've tried his method. I've tried my own method uh, and it's helped a little bit and I get so far, but then I just got to start writing and then to go back to the outline. It's just, it's just very difficult for me. And I find that the story makes 
more sense to me as I write it. Mm-hmm. And the ideas come better and faster if I write it. Um, than well, if it's I try been to an evolution. I mean, I started out that way and it's taken a long time. I've been, a, I've written at this point, uh, 20, almost 24 books. Well, if you count the two I wrote when I was a teenager that really sucked, 26 books. So <laughs> it's, it's a lot of words under under the under the bridge there. So yeah, I can't say it will work that way for everybody at first. But as you get, you know, more things written, as you get a, a, a feel for a novel, you know, people talk about a three act structure or five act structure for novels. Mm-hmm. I never really set out to do that, but as you have get start to get a feel for writing the books, they separate themselves into that kind of a structure. Yeah. You, uh, you don't have to think, oh, this is the second act or this is the third act. You'll just see in, in, as you plot it, you'll see, yeah, there's a, there's a big break right there and they go into another part of the book. Well, you're, you're going into a three or five act structure, whether you know it or not. Yeah. Yeah. It's more intuitive. And I'm, not, I'm, I'm not certain that it's really important to know that you're going to do that beforehand. I mean, some people, some people kind of go all, all over the place with pacing and structure, but. Once you get enough experience, and if you've read enough, you're on your own. You'll just fall into that kind of a structure because it's natural. That's why right. movies, movies have it and books have it. It's because you expect it. It's not just because you've watched movies and and you know what to expect. It's it's how we expect things, stories to be told. It's beginning, a middle, and an end. It's just being human. Right. Well, I mean, that's with anything. I mean, if you're if you're a bricklayer. You know, you're not going to be sitting there checking your instructions every now. Okay, now I put down the mortar. Okay, now I pick up the brick. Okay, now I put the brick on the mortar. Okay, now I scrape. And it's, you don't do that. You just stick, scrape, plop, scrape, plop, scrape, plop. You know, it's just you just know what you're doing at some point. Um, at the beginning, you don't because you got to think about it, the steps that you're going through. But as you do it more, you just kind of fall into that pattern. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, that's it's very intuitive for me on my part too, and. Um, uh, I don't try to do the three X structure. I think that's good, though. I, mean, I don't want to decry it because it's it's really good if, um, a tool to use to make sure if if like your story seems to be going off on some direction and it doesn't seem to be going anywhere or whatever, you can go back to that three X structure or five act or whatever you use to kind of like get it back on center. If you don't plot, if you do plot, then I don't think that's really a problem. I think that's probably a, a problem unique to pantsers or someone who doesn't strict stay close to the plot. Um, I, I have to admit that I enjoyed pantsing a lot more. <laughs> Not that I don't enjoy writing, but for me, when I write, the outline now is like the most fun part because I'm mm-hmm. finding out what happens. I'm coming right. up with ideas. And when I was pantsing, that would happen as I wrote a novel. So it would be like reading the novel for me. Yeah. As, yep. I, as I wrote it, I would be reading and I would be letting, I let the characters guide, you know, guide the story more. I mean, I still try to let them guide the story, but they they have to do it in my head in this outline. I have to think, what would they do in this situation? But if you do it as you write, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's, it's, um, it's, it's more like watching a movie, mm-hmm. you know, you're not, if, if if you've watched one of the uh, like a Marvel movie or a Star Wars movie, and you think, wouldn't it be cool if this happened right here? Right, exactly. When you get to do that with your and and you watch the movie play out with the plot going the way you wanted it to go out. Yeah, yeah. It, it was a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun writing, especially the the Duty Honor Planet books. Uh, I got a lot more involved emotionally with those characters. When people say how it's hard to kill off a character, oh, I hated, I hated killing. Them. <laughs> but now it, it, it's it's still fun writing. It's uh, I just get I get the that movie watching experience when I write the plot instead of actually writing the words of the book. Yeah, I don't know how much I'd like that. I don't know if I could do that because <laughs> I like too much discovering what the characters are doing and. There's, I mean, I, I still have a plan for where I want the story to go, but how it oh, gets I there. When I was, when I was pantsing, I, I, I would write like little synopsis of, of the book 
and just try to get there. But I always wound up going somewhere else. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, and that's just I think it's just the characters, you know, how they react to certain situations. You get an idea, but then that character would react this way to that situation, and it just kind of derails your plan unless you like really work really hard to get it back around to where you were intending to go. Well, the third, a- the third duty on our planet book, which was called uh, the Line of Duty. I threw in this minor character. He's like a bureaucrat. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I only threw him in because it was, it was basically an in joke for some people that I hung out, hung out with on a message board. I promised them I would throw this character in. So I did. And it was just going to be one scene and he's gone. He wound up being the overarching villain for all three books. <laughs> That's awesome. Brain mind everything. <laughs> I did not intend for that to happen, but I started thinking, well, this had to have happened at some point. Who would have been in a position to pull this off? Yep. I'm like, well, he's the only one that I've introduced so far. So if I don't want to introduce somebody totally new, it's got to be this guy. Yeah. <laughs> so let me ask you about that. So the, the, when, uh, uh, when you finished the book um, and this character showed up and he did his one scene, was he did his one scene and he was gone? And then so when it was revealed that he was the big bad guy, was it a real, a real shocker moment? Like, what is that guy? No, he was he was in the fir- he was in that one scene, but the nature of the third book was that they were going to have to interact with his department. He was like a department head, mm-hmm. and they had to interact with him. The main characters are military intelligence, and he was the head of the futuristic equivalent of the FBI, let's say. Okay. And they had to work with him because the initial the initial uh, disaster that prompted the book was what they thought was a terrorist attack. And the president was dissatisfied with the federal cops handling of it. So he put these military intelligence people on it. So they had to interact with him and it was kind of a head to head thing. And as the book went along, I started thinking, well, you know, back in book one, uh, somebody had to be able to brainwash this one character and, and, program him to act in a certain way for this plot to work the way I'm doing it. Who would have been in a position to do that? Like, well, I guess the guy who's the head of the federal cops would be in the best position to do that. <laughs> it was uh, it was fun. I, I had a lot of fun writing that series. I had, I felt bad. I felt the way I felt when it ended was the way I felt after watching the third Lord of the Rings movie. You what know, was that? Return of the King. Those movies came out over like a three-year period. Right. Yeah, I Your remember watching them. And just the 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 feeling I had watching the music go up on the ending of Return of the King was that it had been a, like a, a story that I've been that had been being told to me for three or four years. Oh. Now it was over, and I felt sad that I wasn't going to be with these characters anymore. And I felt the same way for this book because the way I ended it, I could have gone back, and some people asked me to go back, but I didn't feel right. It felt like a really good ending mm-hmm. to that to that story. And if I went back to that universe, I wouldn't want to go back to those characters because their story had been told. I didn't kill them all off or anything, but. Right. They, their their arc had been had been made. They had gone from their beginning to their culmination. So, so your different your different series like Recon and um, Glory Boy and all those they're different. They take place in different universes. Then no, uh, the Duty Honor Planets trilogy takes place in its own separate universe. Basically, everything else takes place in the same universe. I call the Birthright Universe. Oh, okay. Except for my standalone novel, Seeds of Gaia, which is also by itself. But the Glory Boy and the Birthright series, the Recon series, Last Flight of the Acheron, and the Tales of the Acheron series, and the Psy War series are all in the same universe. And they all feature at least cameos by the same characters. That is awesome. I and Psy War, War, the final trilogy brings them all together in one big apocalyptic. Oh, that is cool. And basically I, I I got to the point after all those series before Psy war kind of take place synchronously. They're, they're like either they start out right around the time of the war 
-hmm. And then they go to this point in time where there's a, there's a big, I guess, coup attempt would be the way to put it by these uh, corporate monopolies to try to take over the government. And that is like the, the place where they all come together. And then in Psy War, I brought them together after that. And I couldn't think of how to involve all the characters with each other. And finally, I said, you know, this, is, this universe has become really, really complicated. And it's becoming harder and harder for me to keep track of it. So I'm going to burn it down. <laughs> and I did. I destroyed everything. Wow. So they're all dead. <laughs> no, no. I mean, I, kill, I, I destroyed the, uh, I destroyed the civilization. Hmm. There's, there's so, so many different colonies that I'd mentioned in different books because I had four different series mm -hmm. or three different series before that. And they they'd gone to all these different colonies and I had details about the planets and I just couldn't keep it all straight anymore. I'm like, yeah, time to yeah, start yeah. over the same characters. Well, I killed off some of them, but most of them were still alive at the end. And, but they just, the civilization's like totally wrecked and they have to rebuild it. Wow. That's crazy. So did you get uh, any backlash from killing off those, those certain characters? Uh, well, I got one bad review because the guy didn't like that one of the characters died, but, but the, the, uh, the series that they were in didn't do that well. So I didn't care. I wanted to get rid of them. <laughs> <laughs> your, your bad review doesn't matter. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I honestly, that's, I had to kill some people off cause otherwise it would have been, you know, like, Oh, if everybody lives, what's, where's right. the, where's the drama so I had to kill yeah. some people off. And I, I didn't want to get rid of, uh, certain characters cause I wanted them to, I don't want to reveal the plot, but in the in the end of the third Psy War book, they kind of clash. They have a a difference of philosophy, so I wanted to keep them around. So I didn't have any choice but to kill people from the other series, and I wanted to anyway because I'd written that series with all kinds of high hopes, but nobody oh. liked it. So. Oh. <laughs> the, you should be selling better. Die. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've I've got a. I mean, I've got one series. Well, I have two series right now that I'm working on, a short story series and a, and a novel series. And I'm just wondering if and when I should kill off certain characters. I guess it just happens as the story comes. Never kill off a character. I mean, people do this, and I don't like it. Never kill off a character just to shock the reader. No, no, I couldn't do that. No, I, mean, I, I don't I don't like believe in killing off a character just to, to prove to the reader anybody can die. I mean... I mean, you do have to prove that anybody can die, but you need to do it in a way that advances the plot. Right. If a character dies, it needs to be something that's either meaningful or that's that's crucial to the plot. Yeah, it's got to be a reason for it. Yeah, like in, although, in, my, in my second Duty Honor Planet book, um, Honor Bound, there had to be some sort of an assassination at the beginning to get things rolling. Somebody had to to be killed in order for them to start investigating. And I really didn't want to kill any of my characters, but there was one who had made the most sense to kill. And I felt bad because this this person was had kind of had their happily ever after at the end of the first book. Oh. But uh but they you know, they they stuck their nose in and, and they, <laughs> they got killed and uh and it made everybody else start investigating. So Wow. So at the beginning of a book you kill off a main character. <laughs> I wouldn't say he's a main. He's one of one of the one of the group of main characters from the first book. Yeah, yeah. It had to be somebody the readers would care about because if it was just some nobody, then why would they right. care if anybody investigated why he died? Right. Well, you know what? That's see, I got mixed feelings about that. I don't know if you have you read the Galaxy's Edge uh, series. I've read the first three books. Okay, I'm trying to think. Of it. So you read Kill Team then? No. Okay. I don't think that's well, the third book, is it? No, I'm pretty sure yeah. it's not. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a Legionnaire, uh, Galactic Outlaws, and then Kill Team. Maybe I did read Kill Team then. It's been a while, so I don't know. Kill Team is the one where they're uh, Sean and the, it's right after Kublar, and they get recruited to go in uh, to take out the the G, the donkey people that are trying to slam a, a spaceship into the the core world, the center of the House of Reason. Mm -hmm. 
Well, anyway, a major character uh, I thought was a pretty cool character from the first book gets killed in that book. And I'm like, that dude was barely in there. And he was awesome. And he just killed him right off. It's like, ah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> this upset me so much. Well, I, I I try not to kill the awesome characters until until near the end if I kill yeah. them all. Like in the Duty Honor Planet, again, there's a couple of – they're a couple of my favorite characters. They're based on real people I know too. <laughs> and, and I killed them off near the end of the book just because they were fighting impossible odds. And if nobody had died in the fight, it would have seemed cheap. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's cool. I appreciate your um, your views on that. Well, wanting to make characters death count, death count, and make sense. Um, so what's basically your... these, these characters were were career servicemen who they didn't really have much of a private life outside this the military. They were they were the kind of people that you know that their marriages and relationships had basically soured because they were just too committed to their jobs. So this was the kind of end they probably would have wanted. I figured. Oh, uh, yeah, that makes sense. In, in, in battle, you know, in a big blaze of glory. So, <laughs> so what's your, uh, you said you have a day job still. What's uh, what's your writing routine look like? You, I saw you earlier, you posted that you belted out 30,000 words today, which is absolutely insane for my level. So, that's what uh, I do every day now. Oh, that's, I wish, I, I can't wait to get there. It's, it, yeah, I, I can tell you that, Practice is a lot of it. It just takes a long time. And also for me, I don't know for anybody else, but I'm working on two different things right now. So 1,000 words in one book and 2,000 in another. And what I have found, and this may change eventually too, that I can't write more than about 2,000 words in one book in a day. That I just start to get burned out and it's diminishing returns. If I wrote, if I, if I write 2,000 words in just one book in a day, It'll take me till 10:30 at night to finish. Wow! Going back and back to it. If I write 3,000 words in two different books, it'll take me till 10:30 at night to finish. Hmm. Because doing the one and then t cutting off there and then doing the other just seems so much easier to me than sitting down and writing the 3,000 words in just one story. Because at some point I just need to recharge on that story and start again tomorrow. I start getting one of those things like where your eyes start to glaze over when you look at the words. Yeah. But if it's two different stories, it's easier. And I'm, I want to get to 4,000 words a day. And if I do, I'm pretty sure I'm going to be doing three different things. You know, 1,000 and two, 1,000, one story, 1,000, another 2,000 and a third. And I think I can do that as long as I'm not trying to write 4,000 words in the same, the same book in a day. Yeah. Uh, that, basically but... my, my schedule is, I'm a substitute teacher. Oh, okay. um, and I can write during the day some. I mean, because you're just sitting there in class doing nothing. <laughs> uh, yep. Babysitting teenagers. So I can write. And I, I get about 1,500 words done in the day while I'm working. I'll do 1,000 words in one book before I try to get done by 11. And then... Before I leave at two, I get 500 words done in another book. And nice. then I'll go home and I will either work out and then write another 500 words. I'll write 500 words and then work out depending. And then I'll have dinner, you know, family time and stuff. And then I'll settle down in the evening at about eight o'clock and write the last thousand words. And usually it takes me till 10. Okay. So you like, you split it up throughout yeah. the day. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I know some people just sit down for like a nine to five job type thing and write for four hours. I just, I can't do that at this. Maybe at some point I will be able to, but for me, I need, I need the, the break. I need to shake off the mental cobwebs and recharge. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I, I've heard a lot of authors um, talk about um, how, even though they're full time, they'll, excuse me, They'll might do some like uh, social media stuff in the morning. Um, maybe do a little bit of writing, then go exercise or whatever. Come back, do some plotting, do some writing, and write for a few hours, and then stop for the day or something like that. 
Um, so I guess people just can't write that much. I, I've, I write for maybe an hour and a half, uh, hour, hour and a half in the morning. And then I have to, then I, I stop. So I got to tend to my family and house stuff or whatever I need to do. Um, but with the sprint writing sprints I've been doing lately, I've been able to get like maybe a thousand words, uh, out. But then, uh, when I'm at my job on my break, I'll go ahead and try to belt out some more on a different story, but then I'll try to do another story in the evening after I get home, which is like 10 o'clock at night or whatever. So, um, that seems like to be the pattern uh, for people who are serious about writing. It's like you get this idea in your head, like, okay, if I'm going to be a writer, I'm going to work nine to five. I'm going to write from nine to five. Well, I guess you can't really, people can't really do that. We're not programmed to do the thing that way. Oh, I wish I could. I'd like, I'd love to be done by five o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. I mean, that'd be super. Cause I, I don't write every hour of the day, but I'm writing all day long. Right. You know what I'm saying? I, I I'm writing from, the morning when I sit down to when I go to bed, I don't write the whole time in between, but it's spread out throughout the whole day. And I'd love to be able to just stop at five o'clock and say, Oh, that's day and, and do something else because not- as, as it is, I don't, I don't watch much TV anymore. Um, I used to follow a couple different shows, you know, and just, be able to sit down and watch them at night. But now I've, I've got to use my head for something else. I can't, I can't turn my brain off. I've got to yep. keep thinking about the book. And it, uh, I don't know that I miss being able to do that, but uh, sometimes it feels like uh, I should miss it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like uh, I used to watch TV a lot. You know, I don't watch it so much anymore because because of kids and, and uh, my job, and I want to make a writing career, um, so I just don't have time. But uh, it's, it's like I miss the shows that I used to watch, but the stuff that's on now, it's like I really don't care that much about it. I want to see Star Trek Discovery because I'm a, I'm a Star Trek fan, um, and it looks cool. I want to see if it's worth anything. And but uh, I might I would like to watch the Galaxy's Edge um, show whenever it comes out. But beyond that, there's not much I really am interested in. And I'll watch something with my wife if we watch something, but that's about it. Everything I like to watch gets canceled, it seems like. But I, <laughs> I, I like The Expanse. I, I, uh, that's my favorite, one of my favorite shows. Yeah, I've heard that's good. Yeah, it's getting, it got picked up by Amazon, so I can't wait to see that. Oh, that's um, probably at Prime then. Yeah, it's Amazon Prime. I, I, I subscribe to it anyway for the free shipping and stuff, so. Yeah, we, we subscribed to it for a while when it was super cheap. Um, might do it again because we do order a lot of off there. Well, they're gonna have, they're gonna have that Lord of the Rings TV series on there too. Yeah, I saw, I see like things come up on my YouTube feed for that. That's my TV now is YouTube. <laughs> Just little short videos here and there. Well, I watch a lot of I watch a lot of YouTube because when I'm writing, I will put. Um, music videos on in the background on YouTube. I, I used to try to wear headphones and listen to music that way, but it distracts me too much. Really? So just having it, having the TV, a low volume, you know, and playing YouTube music videos in the background, that, that seems to be the best white noise for me to, to shut everything out while I'm writing. That's interesting. Yeah. I'll do, so I'll do I, I watch a lot of music on YouTube. I've seen basically, every video that Mumford and Sons has made because my TV started thinking I liked it. I do because <laughs> yeah, I've listened to it over and over. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so what do you have? Um, so you got the, the thing you're doing for, um, Athon, Athon books and you're co-writing with, uh, Drew Avery. Drew Avery. I keep, it's like I'll tip my tongue. I'm like, eh. uh, well, the, the, the series I'm writing for Athon is called wholesale slaughter. And it's about a family friendly name. <laughs> well, it's, it's the name of a mercenary unit. Mm-hmm. It's, it's kind of, it's kind of ironic in itself. I mean, the name's supposed to be ironic because it's made up. The, the, the unit is a cover for an intelligence operation. And the son of the leader of one of these 
basically it's a kingdom, although they call it something different, hmm. is, is, has volunteered to go on this operation because he's been – he kind of separated himself from his family so because he's in the military and he didn't want to get special treatment. So he changed his name from his father's name and they kind of expunged his records so he could go through the academy and become an officer without people thinking he just got this because he's the, the guardian's son. So when the time comes for this, he still doesn't want to go by his real name because he, he figures somebody will put two and two together and recognize him. So they change his name to this cover file that they already have set up to put somebody undercover. And the cover file's name is Jonathan Slaughter. So <laughs> he becomes Jonathan Slaughter and, and they're trying to come up with a reason for him to be traveling through enemy territory because they're not actively at war, but they're rivals and, they're not going to let military transports go through their territory, right. but he needs to have military force with him to do what he's going to do. So somebody suggests mercenaries because a lot, there's a lot of mercenary units out in the, the borders between these kingdoms where nobody enforces the law or protects the, the small colonies. And they have to come up with a name for it. And he, and he calls it wholesale slaughter. And everybody's like, Oh my God, you can't be serious. It's like, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious that's great like so wholesale like like you go to a wholesale store so it's right like, exactly wholesale slaughter wow now, credit where credit is due i have a friend whose last name is slaughter and he he used to want to open up a gun shop and i suggested to him once you know sarcastically you should name it wholesale slaughter so did he, did he actually do it name. no oh. <laughs> <laughs> You didn't want to attract any undue attention, so no. <laughs> so you said his last name was Slaughter. I may, I immediately thought, okay, this is, does he become a sergeant? Because then he'd be Sergeant Slaughter. Actually, my friend was in the National Guard, and he became a sergeant for a while. <laughs> he was sergeant Slaughter. That is awesome. Then he went to OCS and ruined it all by be becoming Lieutenant Slaughter. Oh. <laughs> but for a while, he was Sergeant Slaughter. Wow. That's cool. He looks nothing like Sergeant Slaughter. He's like... Five eight, hundred and fifty <laughs> pounds. So <laughs> that's that's how tall I am. That's how big I am. That's funny. Yeah, it's hard. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's just funny. That's that's the uh, it in that the cover unit goes through a lot of different reasons for being in the series. And I don't want to spoil anything because it hasn't come out yet. But they go from going undercover to get through enemy territory to trying to get this objective. And then later on, it becomes something more expansive, you know. And I think I think people are going to like it. I I I haven't written any kind of uh, mech type stories before, so this is something new for me. But I've always wanted to. I wrote a lot of uh, half chapters and two or three chapter start and stop things with mechs in them before, so it's, it was really fun writing it. So, so, so this is a, a mech. Oh mech yeah. Warrior. Okay. Mech, not mech warrior because that's that's well, trademark. right. That's trademark. Yeah. But <laughs> this is mech a mech warrior type. They they have mechs. They have mecha, yeah. anthropomorphized tanks. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's, that is, that's the technique. Yeah, no. They have anthropomorphized tanks. I had not thought of it that way. That is so true. That is hilarious. Uh, and and there's a lot of there've been a lot of science fiction, you know, speculative fact articles about whether or not that would ever happen. And some people say it might happen, like for a time, we go through a phase, you know, but it's not really practical. So I had to come up with a re being the type of science fiction writer I am. It doesn't have to be possible, you know, with physics and everything, but mm -hmm. it's got to be consistent. So I had to have a reason why they would have mechs because in like the Battletech universe, there really is no reason why they have mechs. You know, <laughs> they, they just adjust the physics so that mechs are the best thing around. So uh, in this universe, in the in the wholesale slaughter universe, there was an empire that fell, and it left behind these different kingdoms they call dominions, and they are stuck at a certain technological level because they don't have the benefit of the manufacturing 
and the the research and the scientific knowledge just that this empire had. So they have these mechs because this was the level the empire was at when it fell. Ah. And eventually the empire would have moved past this to something more advanced, but right now they're stuck technologically. So, because they, you know, they, there's going to be phases militarily. Like people talk about how oh everything's going to be drones in the future. Well, things are going to be drones until somebody comes up with a way of hacking the drone signal and making them attack you, right? Or civilians, and then they're not going to trust drones anymore. I mean, you could right. and if they had a, autonomous weapons, those will go through a phase until somebody hacks into those or they go crazy and start killing your own troops and civilians, and then they're not going to trust autonomous weapons for a while. So there's yep. going to be phases where there's going to be battle suits. I mean, assuming we survive and keep advancing technologically, there's going <laughs> to yeah. be battle suits like have space suit will travel. I've, I've actually wrote those in the birthright uh, universe battle suits, but, and there's going to be mechs and, and all that stuff is going to happen, but it, it's only going to last until the technology outstrips it because the, right. the we have right now we're going through all, we're jumping through all sorts of technological hoops to make their armor strong enough to stand up to man portable missile launchers because those get more and more advanced. The tanks get more and more advanced at some point. It's not going to be considered financially sound to make bigger and bigger and more expensive and more complex tanks when you can blow them up with a missile launcher that costs a thousand dollars that one guy, one or two guys can carry. Right. But then they'll come up with another technology that'll make tanks possible again, some kind of force field or something, and yeah. that'll last until you until we learn it. So it's going to go through phases like that and. I just had to come up with a way to stick them in this phase for a while. That was pr that's pretty brilliant, actually, is have this empire that had that technology and just kill them off, and the remnants of it is what they're working on. I, um, yeah, I, uh, yeah, it's like the Sherman tanks uh, were all over World War II, but they were basically death traps. Um, and, you know, as soon as the war was over, they started, I don't know if it was, I think it was before the war was over, actually, they started. Um, Switching out the phasing out the, the Shermans with uh, better tank models, wasn't it? I think the Shermans stuck around until Korea. Oh, really? Okay. I think I'd, I'd have to look it up, but I, yeah. the Shermans were, were were used because they were cheap and easy to produce. And having more tanks than the other guy and more working tanks is more important than having the best tank, which the Germans found out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thanks, but they couldn't make enough of them, so yeah. they lost. Yep. There's a, an old saying that the perfect is the enemy of the good, which a lot of writers have to learn the hard way. But same thing is true in war. You know, good enough. You know, Stalin said, "Quantity has a quality all of its own." Hmm. I like one to use that quote in my in my military science fiction. Actually, huh. one of the one of the actual good things Stalin said. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I used that in the, one of the birthright novels and somebody said, some, is this, this person who's in like military intelligence says, well, as Joseph Stalin said, quantity has a quality all its own. And this guy she's talking to, like, well, I don't know who the hell Stalin is, but <laughs> <laughs> so this it's, is it's like 300 years ago. So, yeah. So this, so in your universe is earth still like they know where it is and that's still, uh, uh which universe? Uh, the the big one with with all the other series. Birthright, yeah. Birthright, yeah. Earth, Earth is Earth is around at least until the Cy War series, when uh -oh. when the uh, eh, pretty much most of the population gets killed. Wow. But yeah, they're, they're still there. Earth is the center of the the Commonwealth government in the in the Birthright universe. Okay. And okay. actually, things were pretty nice there at the time. I mean, we we did go through in the in the birthright universe. There was a nuclear war between Russia and China that's that was scheduled to take place like in a few years. Uh oh, in, in that time. <laughs> another reason to end that whole universe. But um, <laughs> after the nuclear war, things were really kind of desperate, you know. And even though Europe and the United States mostly didn't suffer any of the destruction. Just the economic uh, disruption of everything made you know it, it 
just ask anybody if you if you stop the food shipments to major cities for a week, what's going to happen? You know? Yeah, oh, yeah. Gonna food, people are going to starve. People are going to riot. Mm-hmm. You know, cities are going to burn, and that's what happened. So it wound up with um, everything being kind of burned down, and and people had to reorganize, and they built these these uh, megalopolises. That's the technical term. Like these yeah. cities are all interconnected cities, huge cities. You know, they're they're built next to the old cities. Kind of like Judge Dredd type stuff. Sort of, not quite as dystopic, but uh, yeah. Um, trying to think of a good example of one in fiction. Uh, I mean, Larry Niven used them a lot in his Ringworld series, but you know, they I use them in Duty Honor Planet series and in Birthright. You know, the the people have moved into these mega cities that are interconnected. Um, but even even in a future that's not dystopic. They all had, they have their dystopic elements. So, like uh, the main character from um, the Recon series, he's from Trans Angeles, which is a huge mega city that's located between where San Diego is now and where Los Angeles is now. And it's huge and glorious, but it's got uh, gangs and violence and crime and. A, a literal underworld because the people who aren't taxpayers who who aren't don't have productive jobs they're given everything by the government because you've got really really cheap fabrication technology and i don't mean like i'm not star trek type of thing here but not duplicator but you know you got 3d printing to the extreme right. where you just put raw material in and it'll give you clothes. It'll give you, you know, machinery. It'll give you whatever. And basically, the uh, the financial limit is what kind of patterns you can afford to buy, to in raw materials to put into the fabricators. And if you're poor, you get the same type of like you could tell in 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 the birthright and duty on our planet, poor people they buy cheap but really colorful clothing. Because it's the best thing. They don't buy it. They're given it, basically. Mm-hmm. They have like a allowance. They get it. And they get, you know, all the things you need to live, but they're not they're not pleasant. It, they're, they're stuck in the little apartments that are underground. They have no, you know, they, nobody gets outdoors. Even the rich people don't go outdoors that much. I mean, that's the good thing about it, though, in, in the, the birthright universe is the Basically, the environments had a chance to uh, recover from the urban sprawl, you know, because there is no more urban sprawl. It, what the the main character from Recon, his grand his great grandfather, they're rich, they're a rich family, and he takes him out to different, you know, places in Arizona and Wyoming and Alaska and everything, and he's always struck by the fact that there's nobody else there. There's huh. very very few people living there. He said, well. Think about it. You know, most people can't afford to come out here, and the people that are rich enough to come out here don't want to because they've, you know, they got simulators. You know, they got virtual reality. They've got, you know, all all this opulence right around them. Why would they want to? So, basically, nobody goes out outdoors, unless, except for a few weirdos. That's really interesting. That's a that sounds like a cool uh, a world. Uh, not the term is cool world. <laughs> cool world. It, it, makes the, it makes the main character uniquely qualified for what he winds up doing, which is becoming a recon marine. Because the recon marines in in during the first war in the in the birthright universe, they are you know like rangers or whatever. Now they actually go out into the woods or you know in, in into the uh, front lines in their you know, finding the enemy, calling down airstrikes, whatever. Whereas, as the main the main Marine troops are in these battle suits and they're they're you know like got all this metal around them, it's like being inside. Right. And one, one of the uh, ideas that I came up with for this was that a lot of people, most of the Marines are not rich people. You know, they're 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 poor people because they want to get out of the 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 people who have enough 
in initiative to want to get out of these underground caves that they live in in Trans Angeles and places like that, they'll join the military. And a lot of them wind up in the Marines and they get trained to be put in these battle suits because a lot of these people have lived their whole life underground in closed spaces and they're agoraphobic. Oh, you know, that makes sense. They're yeah. to be outside. That's, that's the, uh, the short story I wrote for Backblast Area Clear for, uh, for uh, JR's uh, anthology was about a Marine who's from one of these, you know, underground places and he, he's in a battle suit and he winds up being knocked out of it during a battle. And he's like behind enemy lines and he has to deal with the fact that he's agoraphobic, that he can't stand being outside and, and all this openness. But because um, the main character from recon was taken out into the wilderness by his great grandfather when he was younger He's uniquely suited because most of the recon Marines come from the colony worlds where people live outside, but the colonies don't have a huge population. So they still get a lot of their recruits from Earth. So having somebody from Earth who actually can handle himself outside is, is strange. Yeah. Which, that's another plot point in the book, but I don't want to spoil anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're coming up on time. Um, uh, appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, Thanks you, for having uh, me. Want to tell people where they can find you online? Well, I have a author website, which is rickpartlow.com. Easy enough. Um, my Facebook page is the technical title is the science fiction worlds of Rick Partlow. The actual web address is facebook.com backslash duty on our planet. Okay. And also you can go on Amazon and search for my books. I am probably the only Rick Partlow you'll find. There's only other one Rick Partlow that I know of that's well known. And he was a uh, bit part actor in movies and TV shows, especially in the eighties. So he's not likely to have any science fiction books out. So I'm going to be <laughs> the one that comes up. I'm also on Twitter, but I can't even remember my Twitter handle. Like post there so infrequently. <laughs> yeah. All right, cool. Thank you for coming on everyone who, uh, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, uh, it's good. Good conversation. Good to hear about your uh, series, and I love hearing about how you connect all your series in the same universe. It's something I'm looking to do with my books as well. So that's pretty awesome. So you're like about ten years ahead of me, so I can expect to be in your place with us. All, all it takes is is writing for about twenty five years and publishing for the, for the last eight. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll try to speed up the writing part. All right. Well, um, everyone who came and hang out and watched, thanks for um, thanks for tuning in. Uh, be sure to like and subscribe. You can uh, be notified whenever we do one of these. I do these about every every other week. Uh, and from until the next time, keep on writing and keep reading. <laughs>